Hello ladies and gentlemen, so last week in the community tab, I, um, I asked a question, which was uh, if people want to suggest questions, whoever gets the most amount of votes by the Sunday night, that would be um, the topic that I would cover. And the question that won that was, do they think, do narcissists and psychopaths, do they think that they are normal? And it will be my great pleasure to settle this mystery for you after I have moved my camera in this direction. My friends, you must realize that in this realm, that must be unsettling for you. Is that giving you seasickness? Um, they loathe the idea of normal. Normal is completely beneath their contempt. They are the antithesis of normal. They are unique. They are God, goddess. They are the ultimate, the grand ultimate. There is nobody but them. They are the center of the universe, the bright and shining star, the sun itself, Amen-Ra, Lucifer. And uh, the idea of being normal and of being treated as normal sends them into an apoplectic rage and or soul-crushing anxiety attack. No, they do not think that they are normal and no, they do not wish to be normal. They would rather be anything other than normal. Why is this question asked? Well, because the narcissistic type will convince you or attempt to convince you through gaslighting and reframing that their abhorrent, unpleasant, boundary-breaking, demanding, attention-seeking behavior is, in fact, normal. They will try to hyper-normalize abusive patterns of behavior such that you become convinced that what they're doing is not abusive, not a sign of a personality disorder, and not something that you should jolly well do something about with a degree of urgency. So I can see why people would ask the question, do they think that this is normal as they blithely go through the world? No, uh, they do not think it is normal. The next question that would be followed by this would be, do they know what they're doing? Yes, they know what they're doing. And this, my friends, is why, that's in the background and it's bugging me, um, is, is why there is this debate over whether narcissistic personality disorder should even be in the DSM at all. Because according to the definitions of what a personality disorder is, it doesn't really quite qualify. To put it in somewhat crude layman's terms, being an arsehole is not a mental health issue, not really. Not if you have agency and control over it. The controversial notion would then be that by giving it this personality disorder diagnosis, by medicalizing it, we're actually legitimizing simply immoral wrong behavior that could otherwise just be, you know, condemned as wrong and saying, oh no, it's a legitimate medical issue. It also de facto absolves the person engaging in these abusive patterns of behavior of guilt, which makes it doubly dangerous. And this happens all the time. So people will come to me and they say, well, is my partner narcissistic or not? Or is it psychopathy or is it borderline? Or whatever? And I'll say, well, does it really matter? And to them it does because it's, though they won't admit it because they know that I'll say they're engaging in malignant optimism, to them it does matter because they're building a decision tree inside of their head where they're trying to say, look, if it is narcissistic personality disorder, for sure, for sure, then we can see a doctor. Or if it definitely is NPD, for sure, for sure, there's nothing else I can do and I can walk out the door with no regrets or backward glances knowing that I did everything that I could, but that that person can be rescued, whatever it is. Whereas I would just say, you're never gonna know. Like if you're in it, and it's abusive, you get to leave. And the reasoning why they're being abusive is not really any of your business. And let's, you know, work against this tendency to medicalize uh, perfectly normal issues by just saying anybody can have a bad day. Hell, anybody can really have a bad year. If you're in a marriage and you got into it for the long haul, 
with serious intent and you love that person and you trust that person and you know them to be of good character and something happens or something happens in their life or your life and it puts them into a bad state even for a period of time um, that can be allowed for not everything is a mental health issue not everything is a personality disorder to come back to the question do they think they are normal the answer is no absolutely they do not think they are normal they think they are special they think they are unique. They think they are entitled. And their specialness and their uniqueness is what legitimizes their behavior. It's because they are not normal that inside their head they think they're allowed to do what it is that they do to you, to family members, to people they work with, and to the rest of humanity. Because they are not a part of the mass of humanity. They are not a member of the hoi polloi, the lumpen proletariat, the untermensch, the mere mortals as you and I are. No, no, there's something quite special. So the answer to the question, do they think they are normal, is no, they do not. And the follow-on question, which inevitably comes, is do they know what they are doing? The answer is yes, they do, which means that saying it's a mental health issue, calling it a personality disorder, when the person is willfully engaging in the behavior with agency, they don't suffer from a loss of control. We know that because when threatened, they can switch it on and off. They can switch their abusive behavior on and off. You can't say to somebody who's got a, psych a psychotic spectrum disorder, switch it on and off. You can't say to somebody with a, a schizotypal personality disorder, switch it on and off, or threaten them into, into making it withdrawal. Think about that. But you can with a narcissist, and most of the people here know fully well that that's the case. When threatened, when backs against the wall and the potential loss of something they really, really value is on the table, they change their behavior like that instantly. I had an experience with an ex of mine. I don't talk about my ex as much because I don't like talking too much about my private life, but I will share this with you. I got into the pattern when she was gaslighting me, lying to me, um, during arguments, I would pull out my phone and start to record it. And it was the most incredible and heartbreaking thing to watch. Once she knew she was on record, her face, her tone, her body language, and the story would completely alter. That is a person who is in control. So when we say, oh, it's a mental health issue, the implication is the person has no agency and there's nothing that they can do. In the case of narcissistic personality disorder, this simply is not true. I have spoken about this for just under eight minutes. Um, if anybody would like to ask me a question that relates to whether they know that they have narcissistic personality disorder or you want to ask a question about borderline or psychopathy, now would be a good time to do it. Please make it one sentence long and end it in a question mark, that would be helpful for me. Oh, people are saying, yes, I've done that, they've done the recording thing, and yes, I have a video like that, that's the crazy making part. So there we have our answer. Do they know what they're doing? Yes, if they're switching on and off, then they know. Do they think that they're normal? No. Karen says, yes, they know what games they are playing. Absolutely, crocodile tears on, crocodile tears off, says Kay Vaughan, exactly. So people who've lived with this personality type know exactly. Um, what we're talking about here. I may knock the screen as I scroll. Please allow for that. Pod says, Rich, my ex has told my kids he's diagnosed MPD. He would never admit it when together for 22 years. They fell out recently. Is the admission a trick? Well, the show must go on. You know, everything that they do and everything that they say is a manipulation. And the purpose of the manipulation is to garner a response, is to generate a response in other people. Um, there was a computer game that I had described to me. I never played it. I, I do like some video games. I like the, the Call of Duty zombie games. Um, but I had one described to me where the main enemy was made of nanotech. And it was a cloud of these little nanobots that would manifest as the thing that you most fear. And it would change depending on the character in the game, it could be a salivating demon or a hideous snake monster that would engulf you or whatever it was. I like that image of the uh, demonic, malignantly intended uh, cloud of thing that just changes. So its focus is on you. It's on your emotional reactions 
and it alters its shape, its color, its appearance in alignment with what it wants to get from you. It is a reaction-seeking beast. If it wants uh, fear, uh, submission, irritation, rage, then it will be that which garners that. Why do they steal money from you? Um, I, they'll take whatever it is that they need and they feel that, that they have the right to. Um, Jay Russell says, does this presume a cure? Well, it's an interesting question, Jay Russell. Uh, why would you cure something that isn't an illness, but that is simply a decision to do something immoral? There is no cure for something that's not an illness. Uh, Susan Smith says, can years of bad experience make you passive aggressive too? I feel passive aggressive. Passive aggressive, Susan, I would usually associate with a lot of bitterness and resentment and unprocessed anger. Um, if you feel like you don't have the agency, um, the serenity in the scenario to be actively aggressive, to be openly aggressive, then you'll fall back on passive aggression um, instead. So very frequently it's the context that determines that behavior, but unexpressed resentment and, and bitterness and anger would usually do that. Can CPTSD cause someone to drink alcohol? Is that part of dissociation? Uh, yes, it can cause somebody to drink alcohol, absolutely. CPTSD and PTSD will um, typically encourage the um, increase in consumption of uh, or, or activation of all um, self-soothing behaviors, be they negative or, or positive. So it would include drugs, um, the use of porn, gambling, um, if you're addicted to buying things, spending money, whatever it is, the CPTSD is um, a cluster of symptoms that comes about in response to trauma. And it's gonna at least result as a sense of agitation in the body, which of course the human being experiencing it is gonna try and deal with um, and yeah, alcohol would be a way. I usually associate alcohol with anxiety because it is whatever the drug is, it's the opposite of what you're just like, you're trying to work as an apothecary in your own head, uh, like a medieval doctor. And um, so uh, alcohol I would associate with anxiety. The Ancient Lantern, thank you for um, moderating tonight. Ancient Lantern. Do you think children in divorced households who switch between love bombing, who switch between adverse love bombing versus, versus abusive households every week during childhood, do you think this can contribute to CPTSD? Absolutely, because they're not getting consistent messages about the rules under which they live and that messes with their sense of self. So if they're in different coordinated, differently coordinated environments and contexts repeatedly, it's gonna ultimately, it's gonna impact the sense of self because they'll be punished for a thing over here where over there, they're not punished for it, which will lead a child to conclude that the problem is with them, that they are a bad object that needs to be punished because they don't have boundaries to do anything else. Belisario Pratt says, is narcissism more justified in women? I don't understand this question, my friend. Sorry. Uh, Kay Vaughan says you can't talk to a narcissist. You must handle them. 100% agree. Abandon sincere communication when communicating with the insincere. How do adult children of narcissists end up? The adult children of narcissists. Um, well, ask Generation X. Uh, but usually some degree of people pleaser syndrome or pronounced fawning uh, codependent response and probably an enduring sense of sadness and worthlessness. See the grunge movement. Any testimonies to NPDs recovering from their disorder? None that you could trust, I'm afraid, because why would they tell you the truth? You're just a human. I think DBT can help CPTSD. Uh, well, DBT is there to treat 
um, borderline personality disorder, which is a manifestation of CPTSD, as is narcissistic personality disorder. Richie, would you say that it is premeditated then? Uh, some things are premeditated. Some, some actions of abuse are going to be premeditated and some will just be little off-the-cuff nuggets of abuse being slung your way. Thanks very much for that. Jessa asks, can being raised by a narcissist mother lead to an innate or learned sense of self-hatred? Yes, it can and it will. Um, one of the videos that I did in the very earliest days on this channel that helped the channel sort of take off in the direction of narcissism was called something like the Daughters of Narcissistic Mothers. And I dealt with that topic. Obviously, I'm not the daughter of a narcissistic mother. Um, but I read up on it and I spoke about it and people really liked it. So there is a video on my channel somewhere about the Daughters of Narcissistic Mothers. Plus, it's a really good website called The Daughters of Narcissistic Mothers. I recommend everybody take a look at that. Even if you weren't raised by a narcissistic mother, it gives a very good breakdown of different types. I particularly found the smother mother archetype interesting. Zulema says, hi, Mr. Richard. Love from Kyle, Tex. How do you, how, why do you feel guilty to move on? It's all legally over. I feel like the cheater. Um, typically, uh, when doing a lot of work with people who are coming out of narcissistic, narcissistically abusive relationships, I tend to stick to my dogma um, that whatever it is you are feeling, it is probably because that is what they want you to feel. If you're actually married to the person living with them, they were your closest partner, your closest person, your, the person you shared a bed with, they're going to have an enormous influence over your mental, physical and emotional state for years. And uh, so whatever it is you're feeling, that's probably because that's what they want you to feel. If you feel tremendous guilt, you probably aren't aware of just how strongly you were guilt tripped throughout the relationship would tend to be my answer, but I don't know you. There could be some other factor here that I can't see and I'm missing. Patrick asks, do the NPD-esque groups or systems in power follow the same dynamics as an in individual relationships that you've described here? Ooh. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, largely, you know, the tactics are gonna be the same. The reframing, the blame shifting, the guilt tripping, humiliation tactics, uh, reactive abuse tactics, you know, uh, the react problem reaction solution dynamic, you know, you can get the reaction from people that you want. And then you'd be like, oh, look, see, they're rioting, they're violent idiots. Um, yeah, you can definitely induce that. That's, uh, that's, that's like reactive abuse. Um, and yes, I do think that that happens. And I do think that those incidents are used to justify abuse and, and further abuse. Callie says, do some NPDs work together knowingly? Oh, Callie, 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 Callie. Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, the NPDs love each other if their um, uh, agendas match. So a coven of NPDs is, is very, very common. What a wonderfully naive question. If, if you took away the term NPD and I said to you, Callie, do bad people who are thieves and criminals knowingly work together, what would you say? You'd say they can and they do. And we have plenty of evidence of that throughout history and in modern times. Uh, Sarah Gwen, Gwen Abel says, another great source of information regarding the issues called out here is Peace and Harmony's YouTube channel, Dr. Todd Grande, Ross Rosenberg, Inner Integration. Maybe that is use or helpful. Um, yeah, you also have Lisa Romano. Uh, you have Dana Morningstar. Um, uh, what's the dude's name? I am I am Narcology. There's a, there's a lot of uh, good sites. Uh, Dr. Abdul Said as well. I like very much. Is no contact the only way to stay safe? Um, well, 
to stay truly safe, yes, but no contact is is not commonly possible. Uh, it's you know it's it's usually that's not really possible. So you have to work towards a principle of no contact by diminishing contact as much as you can, and remembering that any and all contact is an opportunity to gaslight and to abuse. Maria Jennifer says, Dr. Romani is great and has a book on narcissism. She is, I watched one of her videos two weeks ago. It was very good. Dr. Les Carter, says Stephen Joyce. Angie Atkins is great too. Angie Atkinson, I think that is. Yes, she's great. I've done, uh, I think I've done an interview with her. And um, keep them coming, guys. Uh, my brain's not firing on all cylinders here. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's like eight o'clock at night. Mention anybody that, that, that you like. Um, Chris Godinez, who I've worked with as well. She's very good. How do you reconcile that they know with how they play the victim? Is there a way to out them? How do you reconcile that they know that they know with how they play the victim? Ah, um, is there a way to out them? I mean, you can try, um, but you know, just be aware that you're dealing with somebody who has dedicated their whole lives to this game since childhood, and therefore you're probably not going to be as good as the game, at the game of chess they're playing as they are, nor are you going to be as ruthless. I used to teach self-defense, and the example I would give from the combatives realm is if you had two equally matched armies, matched in experience and weaponry and everything else, and numbers, in equal circumstances, like on a big flat field, but one group has a greater intent to do harm, has no moral restraint whatsoever with what they will do to simply inflict the maximum amount of psychological and physical damage on the enemy as quickly as they can, who, who, who will win? Uh, ooh, okay. Let's not get into a tiff over who's good and who's not on YouTube. If people find people useful, then, then that's great. Can we believe HD Tudor or is he just selling stuff? I don't know, I'm sorry. Um, I listened to a couple of HD Tudor videos and I found them very useful. Um, but if he's telling you that he is um, in the cluster B spectrum and diagnosed as that, then obviously you should be careful. Inner integration is great, says Maria, yes. And she's doing it in Spanish, which impresses me very greatly. Miss Webb says, they are born. Why is it hard to understand if you understand genetic imprinting or results generational abuse? Meredith Miller, another person, true. Uh, Linda says, folks, can you purchase emotional literacy and make it work on a simple tablet? I don't know if it's going to work on a tablet. Um, like if it's an Apple tablet, it can be very funny about um, anything that you put onto it that didn't come from the Apple store. A laptop would be safer for sure. Kim Saeed. Somebody says that? Yep. Appreciation for Kim Saeed is, is offered. I deal with intrusive memories. Uh, <clears throat> not to sound like a stock record, he said, knowing full well that this would mean he would sound like a stock record. I would treat them as a manifestation of emotional flashbacks. And so I would be working to stop the emotional flashbacks. That's how I would um, deal with intrusive memories. Um, as a manifestation of emotional flashbacks, for sure. Kelton says, the fact that they believe their lies over time seems to be a disassociation with reality. So isn't there something there that is disordered? The fact they believe their lies over time seems to be a dissociation with reality. So isn't there something there that is disordered? Uh, Do you mind if I don't put my hand in that particular jar of wasp-riddled honey? Um, 
I would need to be in to the material and then you've got to be into when is a disorder not a disorder and it's not I don't know it's the kind of thing a couple of years ago really really interested me from an from an academic point of view from a research point of view but I don't think I think I've read a total of seven papers this year and it's nearly the end of the year I'm just not up on 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 it to that degree um the fact that they get confused uh, I did a seminar with Sam Backman in, in March of this year, 2019, and he said that for, like, if you're talking about somebody where they're vectoring into borderline personality disorder, many of these things are comorbid, meaning they overlap, then that person is on the, technically, by the definition, is on the border land of psychosis. And uh, the way he explained it to me was... Um, it's neither a lie nor a truth in their heads. The emotional flashback is so strong that things become confused. He didn't use the term emotional flashbacks. This is me reinterpreting him. But he said, it's not a lie, it's a confabulation. So there can be a genuine confusion internally for that person, which makes sense. I mean, if you're lying all the time, your sense of reality is gonna get very weak. Your boundaries, your internal boundaries for truth and falsehood will weaken. And then you won't, you won't, you yourself won't know which way is up. And so these things can become a confabulation. And that the reason I didn't want to put my hand in the cookie jar is because then you have to start going, well, how do you not know what truth is? And it's like, well, how does anybody know what truth is? Is memory completely infallible? No, it's not. So Wonder Woman says they believe their own lies. Sometimes they do. Sometimes, I mean, I mean that makes sense, right? If it's if we accept that the NPD um, machine is fundamentally about a false self-image that is created as a mask and a shield to protect protect a vulnerable child self from a cruel, hostile environment, um, then you know every day that they operate, they're they're lying. They're lying because they're invested in a false self and that's not them. They're, they're completely inauthentic to the point where they lose their capacity to be authentic, which is why there is a sad moment, uh, I think, for everybody who works with the victims of narcissistic abuse where you'll have a client in front of you, um, a man, a woman, old, young, ethnic background, notwithstanding at all. Like this goes across every divide you could possibly think of and they will look across to you and they'll say but did they ever really love me did, did they ever really love me because they want that closure they want to know and you have a hurt human being in front of you who has invested time and attention and loving somebody and i ask the same question did they did she ever really love me and the answer unfortunately has to be within the context in which we're speaking that whilst they may have been obsessed um, attached, uh, invested, whatever the word is, it can't really be love because there's no love without intimacy. And these are people incapable of intimacy because they're incapable of vulnerability. Even if they wanted to be vulnerable, I think that they would struggle because they've invested so deeply in their defense mechanisms over such a long time. Excuse me. You have to excuse me, you have no choice. You cannot stop me. Andrew asks, is it a good idea to go to counseling with the ex when she inevitably hoovers just to get her in front of a professional for our kids' sake in the future, even if I don't plan to get back together? These are, this is a, uh, an example of the kind of um, sad uh, question that I get because, you know, with one question, you get a glimpse into a reality tunnel, a reality tunnel that I've been stuck inside of myself. Um, if there's no plan for you getting back with her, then the advantage of seeing a counsellor might be that at least you tried. You can look back in the history of things and say that you tried. It might, but not necessarily will be, that another adult sat in a room with that person and said, you know, this is what's going on. Um, and if there's nothing to lose by doing it, I would uh, certainly 
uh, consider giving it a go, but in the end, it will probably only be, if she really is NPD, um, one more piece of theatre in an ongoing charade, unfortunately. It's not nice being the doomsayer all the time, but it's better to uh, pull, that, pull that plaster right off. S. Robin says, narcs, fake, everything. Indeed. Shauna asks, any suggestions of learning how to love myself as an adult child of alcoholics? I am working your course on emotional literacy. Um, yeah, I, I, it's not really um, my speciality, um, alcoholism. And uh, learning to love yourself is not really a linguistic frame that, that I use. Um, just because it, 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 can, it can spin off and love is used in so many different ways. Uh, if we're talking about regaining personal uh, sovereignty, agency and valuing the self so that your boundaries return, um, emotional literacy is the sine qua known for getting that done. It's the very best way to get that done as, as quickly as possible. The other element that perhaps could be added to that that would accelerate the process would be for you to develop your own moral philosophy. So you would be looking to develop your own value system and you would need to journal it, you would need to write it down, you would need to answer questions like, what is right? And then answer it like you're a philosophy student or pontificate, you don't have to write really good notes, it's not like I'm gonna come around your house and mark you. Um, what is right? What is wrong? How should a person conduct themselves? Should a person lie? When can a person lie? When should you never lie? So on and so forth. It sounds um, anachronistic. It's like really old fashioned and like, Ugh, I'm not, ugh, ugh, I don't like the flavor of that. Ugh, why am I gonna do that? Well, what I would say is if you have a personal philosophy, a moral philosophy based on your value system, you are better able to protect yourself from abuse and you are far better able to make good decisions in your life that will allow you to move forward in ways that make sense for you and allow you to thrive in the long term than if you don't. Is, psycho is psychopathy, Miami Dave says, is psychopathy a brain structure demonstrating the inability to sympathize? Um, psychopathy is a response to trauma is a is a, a term I think the the proper modern term now, according to the American Psychiatric Association, is antisocial personality disorder, and what it actually is is open to debate. But the way we would the the way that uh, the out my knee still is not right and I'm stood up, um, the way that they talk about it in the literature, and the way that psychiatrists would define it would be, or it is being defined daily, functionally, is as a series of detectable symptoms, as a series of detectable behaviors, and um, let's say beliefs, uh, structure of reality that is based in a lack of empathy, a lack of sympathy, a lack of care for other people, and um, a propensity to harm uh, in the context of goal oriented behavior. So it's not like narcissism. Narcissism is very much about protecting and aggrandizing the false self. So fundamentally it's rooted in a kind of vanity, which is why it's called narcissus, <laughs> personality disorder, because narciss narcissus fell in love with his, narcissus fell in love with his own reflection. So it's about vanity, it's about falling in love with this false self, the reflected self. Uh, whereas psychopathy or antisocial personality disorder, they're not into that at all. They just want what they want. Could be sex, could be money. It usually could be fairly primal um, access to some non-symbolic kind of power. Um, but as you work up the scale of psychopathy, it becomes more and more psychopathic until it's not uh, sex and money directly. It could be the power of office that would then ultimately lead to access to sex and access to money and so on. Can you discuss the difference between a fear of vulnerability and true independence, counter-dependence versus liking to be alone. Um, yeah, I guess liking to be alone is a choice, whereas counter-dependence is not. You simply cannot tolerate proximity and intimacy with another. It evokes such a strong emotional flashback 
that you inevitably will push the other person away. Liking to be alone is a choice. You might choose to entertain the company of another person. And preferentially, you might choose to be alone. Uh, Kimberly H says, any effective response when narc support, AA, etc., protects the narcissist by saying, do not judge? I would minimize my contact with people like that because that becomes uh, secondary and ter tertiary gaslighting. <clears throat> There's a video I have on this somewhere on my YouTube channel. If you, if you search within YouTube for secondary tertiary gaslighting, you'll find it. Um, so you're, they then are doing the narcissist's work by proxy even if unknowingly. So you really have to minimize contact with groups who are gonna say things like that. Sam Baknin, uh, Mikau says, Sam Baknin said somewhere that a narcissist is someone whose real self is dead and they can only live as the false self. But when does that happen irreversibly in the developmental process? Um, God, I'm trying to remember what the literature would say. So probably the official answer is gonna be like three or four years old um if you're looking at like i think a mainstream model would say it's got to be by three or four years old um <clears throat> when does it become irreversible <clears throat> i would say it probably depends on the extent of the trauma i mean you might not it's possible that you might not develop it until much later when you're not supposed to um i did see somebody and i worked with his whole family and uh, he was raised, um, raised, he survived um, some pretty horrendous conditions in a Latin American country during a revolution. And he saw really, really awful things. Now he was already 16 when he saw it, but there's no need to be graphic. I'm sure you can imagine having witnessed what he witnessed. Um, I think that that caused enough trauma for him to regress back into the mental age of a four-year-old, and then he really was very, very, uh, very, very damaged man. Very, very damaged. Jessica says, I don't think we can ever say it's irreversible. I used to display, display so many narcissistic traits. People are capable of healing themselves. I'm incredibly self-aware now and constantly observing myself. Why do people say psychopaths are born and sociopaths are made? It sounds like psychopathy is somewhat inborn. I don't know, man. <laughs> it's, it's a long, it's a debate with a long history and it is a bit of a dead end. Um, and you, you kind of, you get to choose. It's not written stone. It's not being given to us by, you know, somebody who came down from on high and then wrote it with his finger in a stone tablet. It's just humans just making their definitions. I've seen things that I would consider useful in the split between sociopathy and psychopathy, and then I've seen other things, and I'm like, that's not particularly useful. Generally speaking, I stick to the American Psychiatric Association definitions because for all its faults, I find them to be stable and useful. Um, so I don't draw that differential. Um, but to say that it is useful, I think to say that psychopathy and social personality disorder does take place on a sliding scale and that there are multiple types. That, that I do think is useful. Whether it's nature or nurture is like, I don't know. <laughs> What's the difference with once you start factoring in epigenetics? What, what, is, what is the difference? I'll take one more question, guys. Somebody, um, Andrew, gives props to The Little Shaman. I haven't had time to watch The Little Shaman properly, but um, I've heard good things. One more question, one sentence long, with a question mark at the end, and I shall away. Uh, can empathy be learned? Ah, interesting question. <clears throat> empathy, um, 
Yes, probably. Probably if somebody was... It depends on why empathy is not being shown naturally anyway, because it is a natural response. If the child through all their developmental phases was getting good enough, not perfect, but good enough contact with caring uh, adults in a good enough non-traumatic environment, empathy uh, will naturally occur. Where it hasn't occurred, I'd really need to know why it wasn't occurring. Um, if it's things like um, culture bound, lack of empathy, I think can be dealt with. You know, I think I think I could go into, I was asked to do this a couple of years ago, nothing came of it. Uh, I used to work in schools. I was in schools, uh, the British education system for five years. And I was asked to go back in and they particularly wanted me, empathy was like at the time, it'd become like mindfulness. It was, em everything was about empathy, 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 empathy. And they were asking, can you teach it? And I was like, under the context that you mean, yeah. There's exercises that you can do that help people to put themselves in the other person's shoes and to think why that would be good, advantageous. Um, you always got to put a sales spin on these things when you're dealing with adolescents who are lean towards psychopathy anyway. Why is this going to be useful for you? You'll get more hot guys, you'll get more hot girls, you'll have a better job. Why? Well, because if you understand where other people are coming from, then you have more insight into how they think. Like adolescents want to be mind readers because they're living in this hormonal world of power structures and hierarchies that they're trying to climb. So you can also spin it as like, oh, um, you'll make better friends and your friendships will be a lot stronger if you have a high degree of, of empathy. You'll be more popular if you have a high degree of empathy. So under those conditions, I could teach it. Now, if you gave me somebody who was deeply traumatized and said, teach them to be empathic, and they didn't want to be empathic. Mm, yeah. I don't know how I'd do that. <laughs> um, Jessica asks, uh, don't you develop NPD following being very narcissistic? It's surely something that will develop if narcissism takes over your thoughts and personality. Uh, again, it's open to debate. It's not a debate that I would waste much time sticking my head into because it's you know it's a pretty strong strongly debated thing and I'm not in the game enough to to really be qualified to have a say my dogma and I'm not at a point where I'm willing to change it just at the moment would be that true NPD takes place when the shell like formation of the heart of the false self <clears throat> was done young enough and became hard enough to completely block all of the vulnerable emotions and to only allow the uh, addiction to God status, narcissistic supply of the false self to be enjoyed. That's where I draw the line. So there's actually, for me, there's a hard boundary there. Uh, but for some people, they would probably agree with you and say, no, no, you'll, be, you'll develop full-blown MPD over time. I, I don't think so. I think you need to be raised in quite extraordinary circumstances, quite unusual circumstances to develop full-blown MPD. And whilst we see a lot of narcissism, I don't think we're seeing a ton of NPD, but you know, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't waste my breath arguing too hotly about it. Like if people said, no, 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 I totally disagree with you. I would go, oh, okay, <laughs> fair enough. I'd probably roll over on that one and be like, nah. <laughs> it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter because to me it doesn't because my, my focus is helping uh, the people who experience narcissistic abuse. If I was trying to heal people from narcissism, it would be hugely important, but it's not, uh, it's not where I have set my intent. What about BPD? Um, it's, it's similar, I think, similar, uh, but perhaps Perhaps I'd be a little looser on the boundaries of BPD. Um, of the two, I would be far more hopeful that somebody could recover from BPD uh, because there is this ability, if you catch the BPD between flashbacks, to take external, um, how should I put it? Not criticism, but perhaps feedback. But depending on where on the BPD spectrum the person is, it's notoriously very difficult and it is certainly not work um, that I am cut out for and I have nothing but respect for people who do do that. 
you're measuring your progress uh, in small increments over long periods of time. Um, so yeah, the boundary for that would be looser for me. Yes, better chance of recovery. It overlaps so much with CPTSD, you know, where DBT works, where emotional literacy can, can work and reducing the emotional flashbacks can work and you have a foothold to move forward. And oftentimes you can have a conversation with a person and say, do you want this to stop their suffering? It's not fun being BPD. It's not a pleasant experience being BPD, but most narcissists uh, of the overt grandiose type certainly are having a perfectly nice time. They're enjoying the game that they're playing. They are, that's where the smirk comes from. I've seen a lot of YouTube videos recently on the narcissistic stare and the narcissistic smirk, and that's where the smirk is coming from on that one. Please don't say stuff about other YouTubers in the comments. It's it's just it's I'm not you know it's it's not it's not going to be helpful. We're going to end up having like a people are going to attack each other over it. So save it, please. It's this is not the appropriate place. What are some examples of healthier, better aspects of our cultures? Says Walid Ali. Uh, better aspects of our cultures? Um, I don't know. I spend so much time criticizing the culture uh, that perhaps I could forget that I'm free to criticize the culture. So that's good. Um, I have the technology. You know, I have this great iPhone, which is a, a, a video recorder. Um, it allows me to do a ton of work from, you know, it's that's that's great and I have the freedom to use it. Uh, we are trying to be fair and just with people where people have suffered in the past. We're trying to some extent to redress those injustices and imbalances, and that's a good thing. <clears throat> um, I am left-leaning, so there is a lot in modern culture that I really like. Um, so if... Any group, any minority group has been... Rep oh, I'm sorry, my left knee is not good. I said the word minority group and my knee gave way. Minority group. Um, where they're being helped or, or, or we're doing more to make sure that they're not being oppressed, that's good. And uh, we do see that in this culture. It gets messy. It's not perfect. It's, it's become poisoned, um, unfortunately, with a really divisive, nasty ideology that I believe is part of a larger PSYOP. Um, sorry, I gave some sane psychological advice for 47 minutes and now I've gone back to conspiracy theory, but that's what you get on the Spartan Life Coach channel. Next week, I'll be talking about hermetic truths and magic. Oh, by the way, I'm going on an ayahuasca ceremony this weekend. So wish me well, brothers and sisters. So yeah, those are the good aspects of the, of the uh, culture. Those are really, really good parts of things. It's I think the essence of who I am and what I'm all about is related to my trauma in childhood. So I don't like oppression. I don't like bullies. I don't like people being scapegoated and black sheep and targeted. Um, I like the idea of uh, freedom, which is what the true meaning of a liberal is. It means you are a liberty lover. Um, and so these are good, positive, healthy elements of the culture and I am more optimistic than uh, any other time that I've been in my life that um, things are going to work out okay. Things will be well in the end, I am quite, quite sure. Uh, wish me well, ladies and gentlemen, for this ayahuasca -y weekend. Uh, I'm going to Switzerland for it. I'm looking forward to it and scared at the same time. Both emotions in the same place, Clarice. Uh, as ever, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for your time and for your attention. And I look forward to speaking to you soon. Thank you.